What's up family? My name is Felicity and welcome to Congo Talks 243. If this is your first time, I would really encourage you to subscribe just so you are notified every time that I post a new video. And for those of you family who have been here for a long time, welcome back. I'm so glad you're still so, here. Welcome to our third episode of the Congolese Pre-Colonial Kingdoms series. And today we are talking about a very powerful kingdom that you have already seen on the title by now. We are talking about the Kingdom of Congo or Congo Dia Ntotila. So without further ado, let's go to the video. So the Kingdom of Congo was founded by King Lukeni Luanini. Basically, it was made up of the northern part of Angola, the western part of the DRC, the Republic of Congo, and also the southern part of Gabon. According to Congolese oral histories, this kingdom was founded as a result of a marital alliance between two kingdoms, and King Lukeni Luanini was the product of this alliance. King Lukeni Luanini became the founder of the Congo Kingdom, or the Kingdom of Congo, after he conquered another kingdom, and this kingdom was called Mwene Kabunga. After conquering this kingdom, he transferred his capital city to a city in that kingdom, and he called it Mbanza Congo. In this kingdom, kings were referred to as Mwene Congo. It simply means the lord or the ruler of the Congo kingdom. The official language spoken in the kingdom of Congo was Kikongo. This kingdom was heavily centralized and part of the reason why this happened is the fact that there was a high concentration of the population in the capital city of Mbanza Congo. It is said that one out of every five inhabitants of the Kingdom of Congo was living in Mbanza Congo. And what this meant is that resources, the military, and also food stuff were all available at the request of the king. So this made him very powerful. Additionally, what also facilitated this centralization was the fact that kings also had a tendency to appoint their close allies or the family members to government positions but the way that kingship was passed on from one person to the next in the kingdom of congo was not very clear there was not a clear structure that they followed and basically what usually happened is there was always a conquest or a competition between people who are willing to take over the throne after the king or the present king dies and that's usually what happened basically the players of these conquests were usually nobles appointed in provincial governorships they also included members of the royal council later on it also included members of the church hierarchy for example so after after the death of King Lukeni Luanimi, Bokani Mavinga took over the throne and his rule was a period of great expansion for the Kingdom of Congo and it even went on to include some other nearby states like the Kingdom of Luango for example. By the time of the first recorded contact of the Kingdom of Congo with Europeans, the Kingdom was a highly developed state and it was at the center of an extensive trading network. The economy of the kingdom at this time was based on natural resources and ivory. There was also the manufacturing and trading of copperware, metal goods, clothes and pottery. There was a lot of these things going on in the kingdom and it was just very comfortable. It was a good time for the kingdom. And then our friend Europeans arrived. The kingdom of Congo first came into contact with Europeans around 1483 and it came into contact with them through a Portuguese explorer named Diego Cão. Diego Cão was sailing through the Congo River when he came through some villages of the Kingdom of Congo and he decided to stop. Now don't ask me why because I do not understand why. So Diego Cão started to create some type of relationship between the Kingdom of Congo and also Portugal. So what he did is he took some Congolese nobles to Portugal and he returned them two years later. So this was between the 1483 and the 1485. Fast forward a couple of years later in 1491, Diego Cão decided to go back to the Kingdom of Congo. But this time he didn't go back alone. He went with some Roman Catholic priests and also he brought some soldiers with him. And this was kind of the start of their hidden motives in the Kingdom of Congo using Catholicism. So I'm guessing between the 1483 and 1491, him and his Portuguese government were probably planning on how to come and just mess up this amazing state that was just doing well in life. Anyways, let's move on. So they came back, he came back with 
some Roman Catholic priests and also some soldiers. And what happened next is that first of all, the King of Congo at that time, it was King Nzinganku, decided to convert himself to Christianity. He was baptized and he took another name of Joao the first. But even though he converted to Christianity, Christianity was still not made into a state religion. And later on, King Nzinganku converted back to Congolese traditional beliefs. But after his death, his son, King Mvembanzinga, succeeded him to the throne. And King Mvembanzinga is the one who made Christianity into a state religion. But even at this stage, where Christianity became kind of the norm into the Kingdom of Congo, it was a different kind of Christianity because it included a lot of the Congolese beliefs as well. And then came slavery. In the following decades, the Kingdom of Congo became a major source of slaves for the Portuguese traders and also for other European powers. But the slavery that happened in the Kingdom of Congo was very different to the slavery that happened in West Africa, for example. And what made it different is the fact that the slaves that were traded in the Kingdom of Congo were mainly slaves from rival armies. So during during war, the Kingdom of Congo would usually capture people from the rival armies and sell them to the Portuguese merchants as slaves. King Mbembanzinga really maintained that these slave trades happen in accordance with the Congolese law. But after a while, the King of Congo started suspecting that the Portuguese were receiving illegally enslaved Congolese. And this is what kind of caused the relationship between Portugal and the Kingdom of Congo to start souring. So after the King of Congo suspected that some Congolese citizens were being enslaved illegally, he wrote to the King of Portugal and he asked him to stop the practice. He also appointed a special committee to kind of oversee the trades and ensure that they were legal. King Mbembanzinga also ruled until his death and after he passed away, his son, King Nkanga Mvemba, took over the throne. But two years later, he was then overthrown by his nephew, King Nkumbiampuri. King Nkumbiampuri also had some problems with the Portuguese because of the slave trade. So basically, King Nkumbiampuri had an agreement with Portugal that the slaves from the Kingdom of Congo could only be traded within the realm of Portugal. And basically what this meant is that the king regulated the slaves that were sold and also the people that were authorized to sell them. But what was happening is that Portuguese settlers in Sao Tome had a habit of sneaking into the Kingdom of Congo and basically buying slaves from the black market. It is said that around 5,000 to 10,000 slaves were sold in the black market every year. And so the king was not happy with it. And what followed is that he decided to break off all relations with the Portuguese and also decided to expel all the Portuguese that were found in the Kingdom of Congo at that time. And these conflicts of interests went on with most of the kings that followed through. So basically the Kingdom of Congo was trying to defend its people and the sovereignty of the kingdom from the people who came as, as, as friends. Be careful who you call friends. And a number of battles unfolded between the Kingdom of Congo and the Portuguese because of these disagreements. And a good example of this is the Battle of Mbuila that happened in 1665, where the King of Congo at that time, King Vitankanga, was killed. And with time, the Kingdom of Congo lost its power, it lost its stability because of all the wars and all of the instabilities that were brought with European. Fast forward to today, a big part of the Kingdom of Congo is now part of the modern day Democratic Republic of Congo. If you want to see the traces of the Kingdom of Congo, I would suggest that you visit the villages in the western side of the DRC. I had the opportunity to grow up in those outback parts of, of the DRC, so I had the chance to visit a lot of villages and this is an experience that I hold very dear to my heart. I feel like I can reflect with what I'm reading and also reflect with what I experienced growing up. So I lived there since I was a baby until I was 15 years old. So it, it was such an eye opener for me. So I would suggest that anybody who wants to know or want to have the remains of the Kingdom of Congo, I would suggest that you visit, you visit the villages in the western side of Congo. It will be very useful for you. All in all, what I'll, I'll really say to you guys is that the Kingdom of Congo was a very powerful kingdom and it is a kingdom whose history was heavily documented. There's, there's a lot of things to learn about the Kingdom of Congo and the way that I would suggest it is for us to learn about it event by event. So it's, it's, it's important for us to learn individual events um, separately. 
to understand the Kingdom of Congo. So there is no video that can ever do justice to what it was because it was a lot. But that was all for this video, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and also subscribe if you are new, just so you are notified every time that I post a new video. I will see you guys next time. Bye.